Okay, I know that we're going to have a few more people come in. Um, how many of you out there are completely 100% positive of everything that has happened in 2015 and what you have available in 2016 when it comes to your digital strategy? <laughs> yeah. Thus, the introduction to uh, Mr. Tony Bassi, who is uh, one of the professors up at U. Um, he uh, works with us at SL Circle and he also is the CEO of uh, FireToss. Um, you're presenting this same presentation where? Or you just did? Or? I did. Three weeks ago in Anaheim at the Craft and Hobby Association. Cool. With all the Pinterest, Etsy, um, anybody in Craft and Hobby, which is a huge industry. Cool. Cool. Where all your disposable income is going. Um, well, you have to have there's a there's a bootstrap or some sort of income in this place. So, you know, it all works out. I've got some great representatives from the um, uh, um, Salt Lake City um, Social Media Club with Jeff. It is new um, implant to uh, Salt Lake City. Welcome very much. Come on in, make yourself comfortable. Obviously, uh, Tad, you guys are going to be speaking sometime soon, and I know that you guys can talk about this too. This is an open forum. Let's get some things uh, um, brought into this lunch that we have on a regular basis. It's informative to those that attend, and um, also to be able to kind of have a Q&A. And with that, let's make sure I don't talk anymore, and Tony does the rest of it. Mr. Tony Passi. <laughs> Um, I was just noticing that that webcam, there's no way it can grab this really bright screen and grab me at the same time. And so you might send out the link to people that I just sent to you. Sure. Um, okay. So um, I know you guys got a pretty diverse background among the group. Um, this is not the complete guide to digital marketing in 2016. This is really designed for people that know something about digital marketing and these are kind of like refinements, optimizations, things that you need to change for 2016. So if you're completely novice and some of this goes over your head, I would say look at the link that Joel is going to send out. Get on my SlideShare account and just start at the beginning and start going through digital marketing because there's a lot of resources there. Um, and then of course at the end, um, I'll be handed out, in fact I'll just sit them up on front here, I'll be giving out my card but I'm always um, I'm always willing to talk to anybody that wants to just reach out and ask questions. Um, you probably imagine a big chunk of my life uh, teaching up at the U. What I do for a living is answer questions. So if you've got questions, I'm, I'm pretty approachable and I don't mind you emailing, calling me, uh, unless you're told. Okay, here we go. So here's what we're going to learn right now. We're going to look at a quick uh, review of just the channel approach to marketing. So this will just get you up to speed with what I'm talking about. And then we're going to look at changes in organic traffic changes in some paint channels, and then some mobile changes. So that's what this goes over. Um, first of all, Joel kind of gave you the overview. Uh, I'll introduce myself maybe a little bit uh, differently than what Joel said. So this is me. Um, here are kind of the things that I classify myself in. Uh, serial entrepreneurs. I've, I've never been in the big, huge corporate environment. I've always started two guys at a card table. Let's come up with a dream and let's grow it up. and you know, $10 million, $20 million company, sell them off and let's start over. And so I just, I love that space. Zero dollars to $20 million, that's where I live. You don't ever want me in your $25 million company. I would just make a mess of it. Mm -hmm. and so um, I'm definitely an entrepreneur. It took me a while to figure that out about myself, but that's what I'm currently on the CEO of Firetop. It's a digital agency. We do logos, branding, content, uh, pay-per-click, social, uh, paid strategies. We've got about 30 people that work there. We're five minutes away from here. We deal with a ton of brands in different industries. Um, you know, it's just a it's just a good full service digital agency. So, um, and then the other thing is, I'm a marketing professor up at the U. That's why I've got the beard. That's why I've got little patches on the elbows. Um, they hand those out when you become a professor, by the way. Um, and if at some point you want to follow me around on Twitter and see the things I speak on during the year, um, I'll probably speak about. You know, I don't know, probably about 25 to 30 times during the year all over the country. So if you want to follow that around, at Tony Passy. I don't tweet about bunnies or children or anything else. I literally just say, there's that talk I gave. And that's about all my Twitter does. So, okay. Here's your academics. You ready? A marketing plan is defined as a process for connecting user segments to a value proposition through appropriate channels. 
Does that sound like it came out of an MBA class? It did. Okay, so let me break this down real quick. And I want you to understand this because this will frame up what I'm going to discuss. So first of all, your value prop, the reason you get into business, what you do, your competitive advantage, what you can do faster, cheaper, what pain can I solve for my, for my customer base? Okay, that's your value proposition. Now, at some point, you've got to take your big idea and you've got to identify who are my user segments. And this is something that's very confusing to people that aren't really, really skilled at marketing. They have a hard time thinking about people in user segments. It doesn't mean that you're one kind of person and you're one kind of person because everybody in this room hopefully has some type of auto insurance. I hope you do. And yet, if I ask you how many would like to hear my best auto insurance pitch, this room just clears out. Everyone gets out of here. We buy auto insurance. No one wants to hear about it. It's because we enter into that user segment, the consideration period of buying auto insurance at a very key moment in our life. And we might do it through an internet search. We might do it because we remember some funny lizard on TV that told us to save some money. We might remember a quirky brown haired girl that seemed very approachable and that speaks to me in my late thirties. You know, that kind of stuff hits us. But as we enter into the user segment, there's something that we think about. We realize that value proposition. We make our decision and then we move on. And so at different times of the day, you belong to different user segments. There are things that you will buy in a certain venue in a certain way that you will not buy other times. If you broke down the cost of soda by ounce and it was sold by ounce to you at the restaurant price, you would never buy it at the 7-Eleven. There's no way. Nobody's paying that much money at the 7-Eleven for what you're charged at a restaurant. So we're different users in different segments based on who we are and what our wants and needs are. And so then the, the final step to a really great marketing plan is how do I connect with somebody? Um, what do you want to see on social media? What do you want to see when you're doing a Google search? And there's lots of types of searches, but let's say you're doing what's called an informational query. You're asking a, an answer to a question. I'm going to jump onto a search engine to find the answer to my question. Rarely do I jump onto Facebook and type in, how are trilobite fossils formed? You'd never type that in the search bar of Facebook. Facebook is for looking at, I mean, you guys all know, old girlfriends and boyfriends and baby photos of people you know and, you know, trashy commentary. And it's the best source of political views, right? You find a lot about politics. It's really quality information. We know what Facebook is good for. If you actually wanted a real lay of the land on politics, you would not go to Facebook. You know politics are on there, but that's not where we go to source good information. So. You need to know what the channel is and how your message will be received. Are you right at the point of buying? Are we just trying to get uh, additional influence? I mean, what, what is our objective? So, and again, I'm going over these channels in this approach so we understand some of the changes. Uh, so the marketing plan is really just that definition of the value prop, the different user segments, and then the channels that connect to our user segments. Make sense? Anybody lost? We're all there. Okay, let's step out of academia and get on with this. Okay, so um, here's the common digital channels, right? Organic search, we all know what that is. We're gonna open up our, our phone, our laptop, ask a question, uh, do a transactional query, I wanna buy something, I wanna get to somewhere, a navigational query. Um, Pay-per-click and uh, organic are both right there in that search engine, okay? And those are very demand-based channels. We go to the search engine when we know what we want and we're looking for it. Okay, and then you get into some of the referral channels. Now, the referral channels, channels are places where they planted a seed or an idea. And this is where social media is going to fall. Social is one of the big referral segments. Um, you're also sometimes going to be reading content on the web, like you're reading a KSL article or you're reading your favorite news blog and you see something about this company that just got funding and now you go and research and somehow you become a customer. Okay, and so different channels kind of do different things. And then display media um, as a potential channel. Display is going to be all your favorite banner ads and pop-ups and all the beautiful, awesome stuff on the web, right? Anybody know what they did in Sao Paulo a while back? Anybody hear about how they ripped down all the billboards? Like they outlawed them? So the entire city's been stripped of billboards. Can you imagine if the internet was like that? We just stripped out all display. 
Well, we're going to come back to that concept and we're going to talk about what's going on right now in display. But, and I don't, I don't negate that there's a lot of other channels. I'm not mentioning affiliate marketing. I'm not mentioning you know, specific types of referral marketing. But this is a broad overview. These are some channels that we use in a digital strategy. I'm going to go here to grab my searchers. I'm going to go here to plant some ideas and do some branding and, and have that call to arms and build that trust and that value. Display is a great place where we can just raise awareness. We can change the whole concept of a word through display. Like um, the word energy drink used to actually mean like vegetables and fruit in a blender. It no longer means that. Energy drinks are toxicity in a large can. The bigger the better. How many milligrams of caffeine can we pack in there? And what can we lace it with? But they don't say that in the ad. They, they just show you, we dropped a man out of space. And suddenly you're like, oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I'd love a Red Bull. Thank you. Okay, so uh, display is for planting those ideas and beginning a process. Okay, so all these channels, you have to work together with the channels. So organic, pay-per-click, referral, uh, which is social and content, and display, they all need to kind of work together um, to have a cohesive, complex strategy. And one of the hardest things in digital marketing in the last five years, it's getting easier, but one of the hardest things, if we go back to five years ago, was something that we call attribution modeling. Anybody know what attribution modeling is? I'm going to out the digital marketing genius in the room. Somebody show yourself. Who are you? Uh, what's attribution modeling? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Yeah, Dean. Where are people coming from? Okay, so where are they coming from? So which of the many things am I doing that's working? So someone made a purchase on my site, but how do I know if they just did pay-per-click? Or how do I know if they just did organic? See, it's not fair to say that somebody came into my website because of an organic search, when really they saw something on social media. They saw a Twitter uh, tweet, and they got this idea, they went and clicked over the blog, they read it, they're like, oh my goodness, I've got to have one of these. And then they go to the search engine, do an organic search for it, find it, and they buy it. And the problem in digital marketing is we look at it as organic, we give us any organic to have a little more money, doing a really good job, and I don't need to use social media. But that's really not true because they, they only went to organic because of social. And so what we've developed over the last five years in the industry is really about tracking and attribution modeling that I know that you know, 15% of the sale came from an email, and then later the social media really compacted the message and, and, and really educated me, and then ultimately I went to organic search and I clicked on a pay-per-click where they were advertising, and that's where I made my purchase. And I need to know what the customer's journey is. Another way to say it is their buying profile. Some of you are very, very susceptible to social, and some of you are like, I'm not. I don't even go on social media. That would be like this guy right here. I just don't spend time on social media. I don't have enough hours in the day that I can surf anything. And actually, my social media habits have completely changed. Uh, quite embarrassed to say, my social media of choice is Snapchat now. Because it just gives me this succinct, clear message. It's seven seconds, no more, and I'm out. And so that fits for me, but you have to know that about your user. Okay. So Google released all this data. Some of you might have seen this data before. Um, if you look on my SlideShare profile, you will see an entire presentation just on attribution modeling that has more of this data. But what we did is we looked at the customer journey. So if you can't read this, it says awareness, where I, I know that there's a thing that I want to buy. Consideration, I really start thinking about, okay, I'm going to buy this. Intent, I go searching for it, and I, and I get into that buying mode, and then I make a final decision. This happens in the real life. Since Dean spoke last, this is, this is an example. I would say, hey, Dean, Come on over to the house. We're having a barbecue. You got to come over. We're smoking a pork shoulder. Well, Dean's probably all in on that. We end up at my place. And guess what happens? Every time you go to the barbecue, first thing I got to show you is what I just bought. That happened? Okay, well, I'm going to take you out. I'm going to show you, look, a Traeger grill. That's what I'm working with. $2,000 grill. Now, that sounds like a lot, but it should be $2,500. Okay? I got it for $2,000. And so, like, I'm suddenly doing this sales pitch. And we do this to our friends. We pitch our friends all the time. This is where I raise the awareness. And all of a sudden, Dean goes home later that night after, you know, that, that good flavor in his mouth. And he's like, you know, 
I think I kind of need one of these Traeger grills. I mean, this thing is kind of awesome. And suddenly he's in consideration. And then he goes maybe down to the Home Depot, jumps in his truck, goes down to Home Depot, looks at grills. What costs more, the nicest Home Depot grill or the lowest end Traeger grill? Home Depot stops where Traeger kind of begins. If you know anything about grills, well, he didn't see a $2,000 grill. So now it's like, oh my gosh, I don't know the difference. The research mode. And suddenly you spend the next two weeks becoming a grill expert. Casually mentions it in a few conversations. Hey, uh, what's your grill of choice? I'm just kind of curious. Are you a charcoal guy or are you a gas guy? And you have these conversations, and you don't know that he's been on this customer journey. And there's influence points. And so what we measure, and finally he will make a decision, and he'll buy what's right for him. But we make this journey down this path, okay? And the journey down the path, Google went and plotted how many times the last thing that happened was a particular channel. So how many people saw a display ad and bought? Almost never. Display is more about introduction. How many times did social drive you to buy right there? Well, that's not really what social is for. I mean, it does happen, but it's a little closer to the south. It's more about education, um, consideration, intent. But things like organic search, direct, uh, referral, those cause a, a purchase a lot more often. Now. You can't be nearsighted and just chop off the previous channels, otherwise you'll never get anyone there. So it's got to all work together, but you've got to understand how they work together. Okay, so that is my crash course on digital marketing. Everybody's an expert now. Now let's move on to 2016 and what changes. So here's what you got to know about in 2016. Organic, the big thing in organic is going to be content and the value of links. Okay, well, wasn't that the big thing for 2015 and 2014 and 2013? Well, we're going to talk a little deeper about it, and I'm going to kind of explain. But just as we finished off 2015, I saw some huge customers of ours take a beating in organic because they're, they're tightening up that algorithm even tighter. And I'll explain to you what I mean and kind of tell you what's going on. Display is being riddled with ad blockers. A lot of you are tired of the ads and you're running ad blocker software. We're talk about how that affects the world. And then mobile. You've got to understand ranking on mobile because uh, a lot of things are conducted on mobile, but organic ranking is a really big deal right now on mobile. And there was a huge separation, and we'll talk a little bit about mobile getting. You ever heard that term? There's a there's a, a doomsday that everybody calls mobile getting. I'll talk about that a little bit. Okay, so back to organic. So content. So content's been a huge part of strategy for the last five or ten years. The person that puts out a lot of content is casting a very large net. Okay, you're, you're giving a lot of opportunity for somebody to find you, find your content, learn about what you're doing, and they ultimately end up on your website or calling you or something. So content's been really big. However, um, even if you do have a strategy for content, um, you've got to make sure that content speaks to a specific, a specific persona. So you don't just put out articles and put out articles. And this is where a lot of people are kind of failing at content. Is they're, they're putting out two blog posts a week, let's just say, because they felt like they should, or because someone told them that was a good frequency. But the blog post they're putting out is kind of crap. It's 500 words, they paid somebody 100 bucks to do it, or maybe they did it real fast, and they're just putting out content to put out content. The problem is, is it, feel, it fills your space with a lot of unwanted noise. And so if I had to give one piece of advice for what I'm seeing in content right now, better content. And if that means slow down the frequency, then slow down the frequency. It's better to put out one really amazing post a month than to be posting twice a week and have it just be uh, not so great. Does anybody know why? Does anybody, can anybody think of some, a brand or something? A lot of messaging and you just you kind of think wow that content should be higher quality why why is it that the mass production of content at low quality like how does that actually end up hurting the, the brand you start getting ignored right that's what i do yep so i had somebody actually come and apply as a director of marketing at our agency now think about it we are a marketing agency being the director of marketing is about the biggest job it's a huge job in our agency. Uh, creative director, director of marketing, those are two pretty big responsibilities where we're at. 
Well, when the person came in to apply, I had to think to myself, you know, I get emails from your current company almost every day, and I have not read one in since the first one. Because I read it and I was just like, talk about jabber, and I don't even know what half these words mean. Like, I mean, I'm kind of in your industry and I don't know what this stuff is. So, I mean, make sure your content is highly readable, engaging. You know, if, if your content's going to be better consumed by hiring an artist to design it all, then hire an artist to design it all and, and allocate more budget there and stop producing so much content. Make your content better. Okay, now the key to content in 2015, a huge key was infographics. Infographics are wonderful on social. You know, there's a good strategy where people would write a blog post, create an infographic, tweet it, share it, post it to LinkedIn. Uh, there's even strategies about you just show this much of the infographic. So I have to click in and now I see this much. And it would increase edge rank, the, the percentage of people that would see you on Facebook if they were clicking on it. And you know, there's all these strategies that we were using. And I'm not saying infographics are dead. They're great. But you know what? Everybody's doing them. So if you want to know what the next step is going to be, it's going to be video. Um, you want to see a great example of somebody that just turned up their marketing in a big way? Have you guys heard about what's going on with the song Studios up at the U? How many people know what's up with the song up at the U right now? Okay, there's a few of us. Um, they decided to be very serious about their videos. And now there's a lot more videos. There's four videos. Just on the whole page, this song is amazing. I can't believe it. I can't believe somebody is doing this. Okay, and the reason why you know is because they use lights and sound and music and storyline and editing and everything to get in your brain, which is so much more powerful than just an infographic. So I just told you to kill your content budget. Maybe what you do is reduce your content budget and focus it all on video and now your email comes out and it's a video watch the video very little text you'll probably up your engagement and see a lot more people more of your brand for your idea okay um so this shift um it's a little difficult to get video made compared to an infographic uh but there's a lot of resources and if you're somebody that just like i don't work in digital marketing at all um, I'll tell you one website that's kind of amazing. It's called Upwork, UP Work, Upwork. They bought out everyone. So anybody that was in the, I'm going to get someone overseas to do this for a dollar space, like Fiverr.com, and if Upwork has gone in and bought out a ton of ecosystems, they bought Fiverr. No, well, there's a deal on the table right now. They bought Elance, they bought Odex. Odex. Um, they, some of them they bought, but they're still out there, they own them and they own them and fibers getting gobbled up with So these guys are going to own the kind of the internet, I'm going to hire somebody in the Philippines business. Anyway, but there's a lot of video artists, a lot of really great artists, okay? Okay, so it's about great content. So another thing that I want to say about content is guest posting, joint ventures, leveraging other people's crowds, these are huge. Huge, huge, huge. Anyone who runs a content-driven business model at some point gets tired of producing all the content. When you show up on your on your white horse with gleaming pages of content that is interesting and say, would you like me to post this week for you? People want that. Now you've got to look credible. You've got to have a great Google Plus profile. You've got to contribute to other places. Make sure you've got a good blog of your own. I mean, you've got to do a little bit of work and you've got to build that relationship of trust, but look into that. Another thing I like is joint ventures where, hey, I'm gonna post over there and everybody that you have that comes to my site and purchases, we'll track them and I'll pay you a commission, you know, sort of a rev share, or maybe we'll post on each other's sites and just kind of cross pollinate. Look for those opportunities with top influencers. Uh, you must work with authoritative sources because quality over quantity matters. What I mean by that is it might be time for you to make the call over to the Tribune and talk to your favorite writer and ask him to come on board and write something a couple times a year. I mean, this is important because they're going to have a following. They're going to know how to write perfectly for the web. They're going to have all kinds of things in their back pocket that you might not be having. And so 
summing this up, my biggest advice in uh, content is you've got to figure out a more quality approach to content. Okay, any questions about content at all? Okay, let's move on to ads. So ad blockers, what you don't know about ad blockers when you put them on your computer is they become this tremendous threat to the publisher, the person publishing the content. Has anybody here had an ad blocker on and tried to go to like a CNN or a Wall Street Journal and they stopped you and said, you don't get to come in here with an ad blocker? You're not going to see our ads, you don't see our content? Well, get prepared to see a lot more of that type of stuff. Um, so what we figured out is that ad revenue is suffering because a 50% increase year over year to ad blockers. So 50% more people are now blocking ads. And what that means is that if I own a lot of content, the value of my content just decreased. And that's a problem. Um, you're taking a lot of revenue away from the person that produces this free content. Now there's a movement out there where they're trying to get pay to play. There's a lot of people that are trying to do this thing where you have to pay to read the content on a website, which I think is kind of a horrible idea because the internet was built on freedom of information and you're going to have a really tough time convincing me to watch your stupid video or pay a couple dollars so I can read your article because yesterday that was free. And we don't respond well as a population to that type of stuff. Um, but content versus revenue, it's going to change. And so what I'm talking about, that pay to play, it's called a paywall. And so something, and I don't actually have the answer on this, but something is going to change in how content moves. And if you're a content producer and you're a content heavy website, a publisher, pay close attention to what the very biggest companies are doing because they're going to lead the charge, they're going to figure it out, and you need to get on board as quick as you can with how they've kind of dealt with this decrease in revenue from ads. Okay, um, ad revenue versus traffic could be hurt um, by some of the Google enhancements as well. So Google was recently testing four ads at the top of AdWords. That sounds so stupid, but um, so exciting in my industry. Um, if you pull up a Google search engine results page, we call them a SERP search engine results page. If you do a Google search, pull up that results page, Sometimes you see one ad at the top, sometimes two, and the maximum you've ever seen is three. And then all of a sudden, a couple months ago, Google just started testing four. It didn't happen in the U.S. It only happened in the U.K. I haven't heard any reports of it in the U.S. yet. Um, but they're starting to test this. Now, why is Google testing these types of things? They test all the time. Well, it's because we fundamentally change how we browse. We change all the time. Um, what we used to click on, we don't need more. We've changed our idea, we now click on this. And they need to keep the revenue flowing. So you're going to see um, traffic versus revenue affect some things that they're going to start changing. Another big change that has affected us, those of us that own websites, is the introduction of direct answers and the knowledge graph. So what Google's trying to do is they're trying to go out to the websites, scoop up the information, and drop it right into the page. So I have a question. Who is going to win the 2016 um, nomination <laughs> for the Republican Party? Who's going to win this year among the Republicans? Okay. If I ask Google, there's a possibility that they found a website that's got a prediction and they can pop the answer right up. And I'll never click out of Google. I'll just read it, get enough information, and I move on. And if you've seen this, it's an entire paragraph of text, right? It's giving you a lot of answers. It will say where it came from, <coughs> excuse me, but it doesn't give you incentive to go to the website. Well, this is a problem because a lot of digital content strategy has been answering questions for years and years, and we just had this faith that Google was going to send people to us if we had the best answer and the best credibility and the most authority and just the best website. And now they're kind of taking that away. The other thing is the knowledge graph. They're kind of replacing Wikipedia, so to speak. You know, you could type in 50 Cent, and they're going to pop up a picture of 50 Cent, who is my vote for president, by the way. Um, they're going to pop a picture of 50 Cent up. They're going to show you where he was born, show you what he's been up to, maybe a criminal history, just a lot of really neat information about 50 Cent. And it's going to be up there. 
because you don't have to go to Wikipedia anymore. We don't have to look at other profiles. It's right there on Google. So this, this changes the dynamic of how we search for content. So Google is always testing. They're going to continue to look for ways to monetize. They're going to continue to figure out ways to put money back in their pocket without hurting the quality of your search results. Okay. The last big topic is mobile. Mobile traffic is on the rise. Did you guys know that? <laughs> Worldwide, uh, mobile crossed over 50% about a year ago. In some industries, it's like 70, 80, 90. Um, if you own uh, a bar downtown, you just might as well just plan for 100% mobile because I don't know how drunk you have to be to sit at your laptop and plan your visit to a bar, but most of us are going to do that on a phone. That's where we look for the bar. We're already out. We're thinking, oh, where are we going to go? What are, what are they doing tonight? Okay, I'm going to head over there. Okay, so you've got to think very strategically about what your model is and who your searcher is. And if you're hitting the 13 to 15 year old crowd, they don't even know what a laptop is at this point. If you're hitting a low end, Income crowd, well, I don't spend a thousand on a laptop, I can just go pay thirty dollars a month. I get a free smartphone at this point. Why would I need anything else? And so you've got to really understand how people access the web. Okay, so mobile search results are here to stay. Does anybody know anything about uh, mobile search results and kind of what happened in 2015? Mobile Geddon? Mobile Geddon, April 21st, 2015. Yeah, well, it actually, yes and no. That's my official answer. 100% yes, no. Uh, okay, well, so what happened is Google, about two years ago, built an engine, built a crawler that would start loading the mobile version of your website. They built a, a piece of code, and they started loading everything. They started evaluating. They talked about it forever. And then they finally came out, and they announced in 2014, said, so guys, about a year from now, fair warning, plenty of time, we're going to start crawling mobile, and we're going to separate the results between mobile and desktop. And right now, if I do a search here, and I do a search here, I'm getting two different sets of results, completely different. Now, there might be some overlap, some companies that are good in both, but right here, I might get more desktop results, and right here, I might just see mostly map and some different listings based on their mobile websites. Well, Google Webmasters put out an entire series on how to optimize your site for mobile. And there's kind of two schools of thought. Have like an M dot site, M dot Zionsbank.com, the mobile version of Zion's Bank. Or the other school of thought is you could use responsive web design. And Google very clearly came out, this is why I said yes, no. Google came out very clearly and said, we don't care which one you have. Here are the set of rules. You make your own decision based on your business. It just happens that for most of us, small to medium-sized business, it's just easier to go responsive where you have one website that readjusts based on the size. Um, but if you're a very large company, you might have a ton of money and a ton of infrastructure built into a mobile version because you did that like eight years ago when smartphones started hitting. And as long as you follow the guidelines, there actually is no preferential treatment one over the other. But I will tell you there's a really good way to screw up each. If you goof up this one or goof up that one, you're just going to get obliterated from the results. Well, here's what happened and why they called it mobile again. Is when Google finally flipped the switch, there were huge companies that just dropped off of Google. And anybody that had 50% mobile searches and then just now disappeared off of organic lost huge revenue and huge chunks of their, their business. And so that was kind of the cry. Well, here's one of the problems, though, with mobile search results. Pretend your name is Google. Everyone just got way rich, right? We're all super wealthy now. Um, what is your responsibility to the population of this planet? What is Google's in terms of search? Ignore all the other 400 business models they run, but in just search, what is Google's credo? What are they trying to deliver to us in terms of search results? The right answer? Per net information. Pertinent, relevant, trustworthy. I'm not going to send you off down a dark alley in New York City and get you clobbered. We're going to we're going to keep you in safe areas. 
We're going to make sure there's no malware on this result and no fake Viagra pills. And we're going to keep you where it's good. Okay? So that's their, that's their responsibility, right? However, you have to read all the content. And on mobile devices, where is all the content? Majority of our time is spent in app. 80% of your time on your mobile phone is using Google Maps app, Facebook app, Snapchat app, whatever apps you use. We're getting out of the browser because what, have, what has everybody been telling us forever in the browser? Download the app. Don't No, don't use Etsy here. Use the app. The app's better. So everyone moved us off of the browser, got us into the app, put the super annoying you know, writers on top of every website and couldn't get rid of them. Okay, fine, I'll use your app, leave me alone, and now we're in the app. Well, Google doesn't know what's in the app. And so Google's getting edged out of the mobile market. This is a problem. So what I expect to see sometime this year is something major that changes in the way apps are built and the way Google gets access to that data. I don't know how visible this will be, but something has to change because I can't trust Google to give me the right results if I do a search in the browser and I don't have everything in the app. Let me give you just a scenario to kind of sum this up. Let's say that something major blows up um, figuratively. Something major happens at the Color Fest, uh, and, you know, the celebration of color in India. Something huge that the whole world knows about. But what if the way you find out is on your mobile device in Facebook, on Twitter, and on Snapchat? And then somebody jumps, like three hours later, jumps onto Google mobile search results and says, uh, celebration of color, India. And up pops all these like happy photos of, yay, this is great, we're doing fun things in India. But no, 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 not on Snapchat. You're seeing real-time video on Snapchat of something horrible that has happened and has got the entire world concerned, and Google is completely out of the loop. That would be a real scenario where you, the user, would change your mind about where you get your information. And when that happens, Google dies. And I'm pretty sure they push a button and the whole world just explodes. <laughs> They've got us completely surrounded, so let's just not let that happen. Okay. So 2016 could be the year of the app content indexation. Okay. Um, now, if you're concerned about your mobile presence, um, Here's my, here's my uh, tools, four tools that you can look at, and you should look at. You should really, if you have a website that pertains to you, you should use all four of these today and see what's going on. And when you're sobbing in tears, because you don't know why your site sucks so bad, you thought that the email address there, you know me, what's to do. Okay. A lot of this is pretty straightforward. So, Mobile search results. You want to know how to rank higher in mobile search results? This is something that Google never gave us before. They give us these tools. They never did this on desktop or anything else. It's kind of awesome. There's something called the mobile friendly test tool. You pop your URL, it pulls up a picture of someone, and it loads your web page as Google sees it. So this is really lucky because Google has come up and said very specifically, um, Whatever I see on your first page that I load on mobile device, I'm assuming is the most important to you. Or the fourth level is, is a menu with links and words that have anything to do with your business, you're probably not going to rank for what you want to rank for. And so use the mobile friendly test tool to evaluate if your site's compliant. Um, and by the way, you might have seen it if you do a search on, on Google on a mobile device. You know, there's a little tiny gray text now that says mobile friendly. Mobile friendly says you've been certified by Google and you're good to go. And you will notice the top eight or ten results all say mobile friendly now. Because people are getting compliant. But go to page two, which is dismal. Nobody's really been there before. <laughs> You'll see a bunch of really sad people that are not doing well, that are not mobile friendly. Okay, the next thing is in your Webmaster Tools account. If you don't know what Webmaster Tools is, um, they have it's a whole collection of tools. But they have something in there called the Search Console that you hook up to your website, and it's how Google sends you messages about what, what's wrong with your site and what's right about your site. So if you own a website and don't have Webmaster Tools, then 
get up, walk out of the room, go set it up, and you can come back when you're finished. You have to have this. This is imperative. Inside of Webmaster Tools, there's a new functionality called mobile usability. Mobile usability pulls how many errors, how many messed up things are on your website. And if your website has 432 things that just don't make sense, why would Google want to rank you? And so that's when you look at this and say, I don't know what these are, but there's 400 of them. You're my developer. Fix it. Okay. So this is imperative to, to getting found. And then for general search rankings, there's now this PageSpeed Insights tool where it'll actually load your page and it'll list off all the things that should be fixed. And I've done this before. In fact, I had a major international fitness brand. I won't embarrass anybody, but a major fitness brand come to us and say, uh, we need it fixed like today if possible. We don't care how much it costs. It takes two minutes, two full minutes to load our homepage. It will load, but it takes two minutes before it loads. I mean, no one would wait. It's a broken site at that point. So we loaded it up, and for two minutes, the website was going out looking for a resource that was on a dev server, a development server that the developer had set up years ago that he stopped paying the account on because he wasn't even a developer anymore. But it was redirecting to another server, which redirected to another. It was just bouncing around the internet like a beach ball. And it was looking for these files so it could load. And after two minutes, which is the timer that was set on his server, go look for two minutes and then if you can't find it, we'll just ignore it. Then the site loaded like that. That's all it was. But you think two minutes is unreasonable. One second. If there's anything on your second on your website that takes a one full second, a thousand milliseconds to load, unacceptable. Nothing can take that long. 10 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, that's where we're looking. Your entire website, first time I go there, I've never been there before, it's not saved on my computer, first time I go there needs to load in under one second. That's the standard for 2016. So the PageSpeed Insights tool will tell you how to do that. Um, and then the other thing that I want you to look at is go on to majestic.com, go up into the menu, and look for their search explorer. And their search explorer will tell you all these amazing things about the terms that you like to search for. It'll tell you which links around the internet are very, very powerful and who is really dominating. And it will identify very quickly who you need to go do a joint venture with and who you need to work with. Okay, the search explorer is a very new tool. And this is a little technical. I'll say it because some of you are going to understand it, but some of you might not. But there's something called anchor text, which is the clickable text that sends you around the web. And Google looks at anchor text to see the value of your website. They said like five years ago that we don't look at it. That's bold. They, they still look at it. They look at it very intensely. Um, they're looking at anchor text all around the web. And this search explorer now catalogs all the anchor text around the web. Like 87% of all anchor text is in that database. So it's kind of amazing. And you can just type in like men's basketball shoes and it'll pop up. Who has the most anchor text pointing to their site for men's basketball shoes? So just kind of cool thing to see who's dominating and why. Okay, we can tell what I talked about. So these customers can get a sort of different channel, different methodology. Each customer segment is going to behave slightly different. Organic is all about content, uh, it's, it's content centered, and then there's revenue problems in Google search. It's probably going to change even further the way we search. So be prepared for more changes, a lot more changes, but uh, it's very content centric still. And that content isn't so much for the search engine, it's really for the searcher. So once you begin to read it, make sure it's that precious moment, they love you, they understand your brand, they want all you on social, they want to tweet about it, they want to shout for the response. Make sure that you have a good strategy for mobile. That you're completely prepared right now. And then last but not least, make sure you use the very best tools out there to find that as well. But I really say this when I'm going to say it. Don't be a sucker and jump online and say, yes, you know the tool for free. <laughs> and start using random tools. Because the people tell you what, 90% of the tools out there are just crap. They don't work. 
There's a major major tool that you use here that we buy all the time that we tell our users use. And I can show you a very quick proof that there's a screen of the wrong information. And the other thing about the one subscribe to you need the wrong information. So at this point, Google gives us the tools. Use those tools like this and those are great. I will tell you they'll keep you busy for a couple of months if you're if you're checking out all those options. And that's real definitely true. Okay. So then I go to my email and my LinkedIn. Uh, if you go to our house all my tools, you can find those tools as well. We went to two or three of them. Um, anybody have any questions? Things I can talk about if you want to know, things I can talk about if you want to know more about. Okay. I can't hear. Oh, okay. So, what do you want to know about how to, how to do the problem? It's super, super fast. Here's the problem. You know, it was invented in public regulation. And you guys can go back and look, and there's a, there's a decree that came out from the FCC that just sort of said, uh, guys, we're not going to regulate these now. We can't. We don't have the resources to sell. So, look, that's how it stands, it's sort of. But if you know, it's the only law of the stand test. You might get a little surprised that you first find a weekend. And then it disappears. And that's pretty good inspired. So for the text marketer, you have a super special task. You know what this is? You have to give your text, but if they're vulnerable and you text them, that's wonderful. But if you want to cross texting and you want somebody to get mad people with texting, super difficult. The reason why is because ATT, Clint, Verizon, and one other carrier, not as popular as I can't remember, a lot of carriers of T Mobile. Stop them and somebody else, but they don't have anything to do with that. Um, and I can't remember, but there's four of them that went to the test. They got together, they did a regulatory association, and they went to their testing. And when you sign up for mass testing, um, oh, it's crazy. You, you pay a lot of money for the ability to just continue to test people. Now, if you want to build your own application system, mass test people, for any, for any reason. And this would be, here's one that I really like. Someone sent us a form that said, yes, I like to talk about automation. All of a sudden, I started text messages to their phone and said, we like, we're going to call you from a number that's unknown. Please answer your call on that in 15 seconds. Don't be following This is one of the costs for all sex because it increases their contact rate tremendously. So if you want to build that, like I just said, you can build that to have an hour and a half. And you can build it on the code of that platform. Colonial was created to back over the testing. It's kind of a pay to play model. So if you've never looked into it, they have, they have a, a Ruby uh, code base, they have a Python code base, Colonial, T W I L I O. It's ingenious for a platform. But you can use Colonial for cross testing, but you have to be super careful because as soon as you break the rules, they will shut you down. Now, I've seen the creator of Colonial side, Colonial, it's a little about 5,000 murder codes. We go together, take the computer, and we'll start texting because they get to watch the show off with a new one in. And I can see that I walk around the warehouse, on my phone, put the water in, and they start texting on the app. That will last for literally 48 hours until we die. Because they write like the heck out of it. So it's just it's not an amazing way to go spam people, but if you want to see the things about you, figure out a way to know you need your phone number, authorize you to spam. What about? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that stuff is tremendously powerful. We have a we have a client who starts in my project is a Brazilian restaurant. Uh, he was the original manager of Chicago, so they have this huge. He said he wanted to build his own restaurant called Two Sharks. Two Sharks out on Sandy Parkway, on a six shop. Really good place to live. He needed to build a restaurant on Tuesday morning. Uh, that's the day five dollars special. That's amazing. Like only five dollars. We'll see in a couple hours. Restaurant is full. Average ticket price is fifteen dollars. It's fantastic to do. Nothing else can do that. Any other questions? Hundred percent. You have no right. I mean. That right there, the whole time we test tool, that top one, 
Go to the website and do that. If it doesn't say, wow, you're fantastic, and if your page speed doesn't say, wow, you're fantastic, like maybe you're above any out of 100, you're just not going to rank. And it has to be amazing at this point. And you can get away with not being amazing, but after April 21st of last year, you have to be amazing. And everybody has different levels of mobile traffic. And so you got to know what your mobile traffic looks like. But one of the places that we work a lot in is trucking. We work a lot with truck drivers. And we provide things for truck drivers to look at. 80, 90% mobile. They're in a truck. They have giant cell phones. That's how you access the web if you're a truck driver. And so you got to know that about your user. But yeah, that's my advice is go do this. I do have I do have four PowerPoints that I created that is a step-by-step -step instruction of how to mobile optimize your website and how to fix it and get it compliant. I don't think it's on my SlideShare account. So if anybody needs that, you can email me and I'd be happy to just give them over to you. So I'm just curious, this might be a, a WordPress site, it's brand new. I mean, is that generally optimized or there's things that need to happen to make that even faster? A WordPress website, brand new, you have bigger problems than being mobile compliant. I mean, like the days of I started yesterday and now I'm even on the search engine are just disappearing because so many other people have been there and have credibility. So first and foremost, you have a really good strategy to start building traffic and authority and start looking like a credible organization. But then when it gets to mobile, okay, I need to do better on mobile. Um, you can get a theme for WordPress that says we're responsive and you can load it and it looks pretty good. But when you do these tools, one of the things you'll see in this first tool, the mobile friendly test tool, is it will load your website and some image that you thought was really beautiful on the desktop is picking up the entire screen on mobile. And you're like, well, yeah, of course, you're just going to scroll. Google doesn't think you should scroll. They think what you want to say needs to be on my phone when I first load the site. And if the keywords, you know, maybe you're selling NCAA approved basketballs, but you don't say that until way down here and I've got to scroll. You're not a good option for mobile results. And so all these kinds of rules um, have been published. And this is why I said earlier, we're in a whole different place on mobile is they never published all the rules. The rules are published now and they've given us a tool for you to double check it. So make sure you check it and make sure you think critically. Desktop is more about engagement and experience and how long do I spend on the site? How amazing is it? They don't look at that for mobile. Mobile is really about information. How quickly can you load my page and give me the information so I can move on with my day? And Google will favor the speed over anything. So when you have a website and you get a lot of traffic, and all of a sudden it dies off, you go to the Google search and you're down here now. If you do these things, is it going to bring you back up? Or are you just toast? You mean on, on well, if you clear it up, clear now that's, a, that's an awesome question. That's a really awesome question because all of this stuff is important and plays into it. But as soon as you said that, I want to give you like 100%. Yeah. But I think of a huge client that we have that about middle of October, they went from number one to number two. And everybody went, wait a minute. We're the best at this. And then they went to number three. And then, I mean, people just moping around 21. Mine, and they're a good quality site. My statusgear.com, there is no thing out there but statusgear. But but since I, my first page, like I said, is, is not, my first page you click and you go to the Lord Nate Charm Cadet. So that's probably where I'm messing up really bad. So I would be happy to just look at your site and, and run through it. Uh, Joel can tell you I love tearing people's sites to pieces. Woo, woo, woo. I do. I love, I love embarrassing people. But it's, it's pulling up. Now if I do statusgear.com search, it goes to that up here. And there's a whole bunch of results. Okay. So it's not even signing for me. Okay. So, so in a case like that, yeah, there's a huge problem. And what you do is you dig in with somebody that really knows how to dig in and figure yeah. out is it this, this, or this, or something completely different. And what I was trying to convey to you is that on this huge customer of ours, yeah. we didn't realize. We thought it was one thing, and we started playing it, and we tweaked. It took us two months to really get down to, oh, my gosh, it's this. Yeah. We fixed it. Two days later, boom, we're back. Okay. So and so it's just Google, come back. Google will always continue to change. And the idea of I'm gonna I'm, I, I hear this, I'm gonna SEO my site and then I'll be done with SEO. No, yeah. that doesn't happen. Organic is this process forever and ever and ever. As long as you want to be on the web, you gotta play the game. Yeah. 
And you might be the best website in the world for what you're doing, but they change the algorithm and now you're viewed yeah. slightly different. So you just you always have a finger on it. Okay. What was the one thing? Who, who said that? <laughs> we found out that there was a couple of category pages on this e-commerce store that were really just category pages, meaning they just were categories of products. And then we looked at it and we said, we looked at the competitor and we actually, and this is so old school. Does anybody know what keyword density is? The number of times a keyword appears? Like, people will tell you, like you could, you could call the phone book right now and every SEO expert in the state will say, 1999, dude. They don't look at keyword density. That was the problem. The top competitor had 43 keywords, had the keyword repeated 43 times on the page. We had 23. And we just kind of not looked at that. And uh, we just made an effort to create enough content to repeat it more times, and we shot right back up. Google will do this. They'll, they'll say, oh, that's over, and then they'll come back to it. And so you just got to be on your toes. But yeah, um, we just made longer content pages. Okay, I'm not going to take any more time. If you have specific questions, uh, pull me aside, talk to me. There's my information. Thanks, you guys. All right, um, as I said um, earlier, we uh, try to make these um, lunches, as today um, will manifest, very valuable to uh, broad swaths of individuals. We're booked up now until about early March. If any of you are interested in um, um, sharing your message, about anything that has to do with um, any level of business that could uh, tie into one of the lunch and learns. Not uh, myself, no, or Tony, who's um, with our group, DC, Linda, Thor, or um, even um, um, Munir, that could help. You can go to our website. There's a link at the bottom. It's slcircle.com, which um, hopefully will be running better since um, I had a little bit of a lambasting by a certain individual because of uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the site not being set up correctly. But these are valuable. Um, to be able to have one of the professors from the U be able to come in and, and um, address you and address your questions, we um, we, we, we believe that it uh, provides good uh, value to uh, you as members of the, of the uh, community. So thank you very much, Tony. Um, you're more than welcome to um, mingle. If none of you have um, had an opportunity to have a tour of um, Holodeck, uh, please um, you know, introduce yourself to, to Andy out front. And um, you're more than welcome to um, uh, um, Network as you wish. Thank you for coming. We'll see you next week. You know, having the decks.